Robinson, who is here, and who is the chief strategist of Temelo since 11 years. And uh, then we have also uh, Arnaud Salomon, who is uh, from Montpellier, co-founder, and uh, he will tell us a little bit about his experience, how to develop a bank based on the cryptocurrencies of that six years. That's great. So maybe we'll go back to the main theme. Uh, how will, how can the banks adapt to the new revolution? You know, we have spoken about a tsunami as well. So the question is a little bit, uh, maybe for Ben to take it from a high level point of view, how will they adapt? Are they adapting? How quickly will that happen? And I think for the bank it's a real issue because, you know, we're seeing that their business models have to be reinvented. We also heard this morning that the banks have to be innovative. So how is this uh, happening? Have you, have you been reassured by what we have heard so far? So where do we stand? I think, uh, okay, so I think you, um, I think you, you raised the, um, the most important point, which is this isn't really about technology. No, none of the, um, you know, cloud is important, mobile bank, mobile technology is important, but it's, these things, what really matters, as you said, is business model change. And um, so regulation will, is important, the infrastructure needs to be laid for digital assets, but what really matters is will banks change their business models fast enough? And I think when we look at the, the banking sector, I, th I think we see a mixed pi picture, right? So, um, so uh, it's Serge, right? So I saw Serge's presentation, now I have some dealings with Swiss, because he's a Timmons customer, I think. And, um, and that's, that's a bank that is responding very fast, right? It's, uh, it's um, you know, it was very early with, uh, with um, trading, and, uh, digital assets, cryptocurrencies. Um, I think what you're doing with the Wake is very, very interesting. So I think, um, you know, new opportunities will emerge. Whenever you have a big technology change, it's, it's both an opportunity for incumbents to change, but a big risk that they won't. And also a, a big opportunity for new entrants to come in. It's, uh, it provides them with a, with a wedge through which they can enter the market and start to fund on new sets of services. So um, I think it's a mixed pitch, picture on it. But I think uh, um, being a custodian in this new world is important. New venues, as you said, new, new venues of exchange will emerge. Um, I think what banks will have to get off is the uh, is they have to get used to a world where they don't make so much money from from, from fees, right? So, so fees in financial services have been stuck at about 2% of GDP for a very long time. And I think they'll be driven down and banks will have to move up the value chain away from, uh, you know, away from just making money from intermediation. You know, they can't be the blockbuster, right? They, the one firm that's addicted to uh, to revenue that, uh, line that's, that's disappearing. So I think that's the, the, the challenge that's laid down to banks. So we'll see how concrete this challenge will be. Maybe uh, Arno can tell us a little bit about his experience. From, from a younger perspective, outside perspective, how do you see the banks adapting to that? Or maybe explain maybe how you have looked at it yourself. Yeah, I mean, like clearly we see today that all banks are looking into the tokenization aspects. Uh, um, today, uh, tokenization is um, also possible because of smart contracts. And that's, I think, something that uh, we should mention here because the smart contract is, is something that is a very powerful tool for the banks, right? Because if you look at it today, the banking assets, they are contracts. 99% of banking assets are contracts. So when you actually move them onto the blockchain in the form of simple smart contracts, you actually have something that is quite powerful. First of all, because um, you can automate a lot of things that are today done in a very manual way. Secondly, because now you can also agree on a single ledger for banks to actually exchange information. Now, when two traders trade, they trade contract and they have their own ledgers. They don't trust each other. That's why it takes so much time to actually do the confirmation, reconciliation, settlements, etc. And even the reporting at the end of the day is most of the time mismatching. Now, if you have the blockchain in the middle that can basically give you a trade and a settlement almost at the same time, that can also give you a way to value uh, uh, the deal uh, in an undisputable way, that gives a whole new set of possibility for banks to reduce their cost. And I believe this is also one area where banks in 2019 will be actually very active and look at. So what are the success factors in your view? Um, adoption. I mean, today we see, we've seen 2018, we've been working with a lot of banks. Um, they all talks. Yeah, it's been a lot of meetings, a lot of meetups, a lot of plans, a lot of PowerPoints. And I believe 2019 will be the year of implementation. How do you share your view? Would you like to comment? Or not the other members of the panel? I mean, as 
you be deep and deep? How do you see that? <laughs> Business as usual. <laughs> so I think money. <laughs> no, I would say uh, the, the question is very wide because uh, we can think of account opening and we can think of documentation management, KYC, identification of, uh, of clients. Then we think of uh, wallet repository services. So it's like uh, transferring uh, the whole value chain we know today uh, on the digital world. So it, it's a process that will, of course, last years, and, uh, and, and the, the next step is, uh, psychology speaking, are we gonna make it or not? <laughs> and as we have to, as you know, master our regulatory risk and financial risk, I would say it takes time by nature. We have uh, some banks that are a bit uh, quicker than the others, but it's a long process. But I would like to be provocative. Do you have time? I don't know what's the time. What's the time frame for this? It's going to how fast it will it be until you're going to be caught by the by the tsunami? Uh, I, I think the tsunami we we see it. <laughs> so uh, I think most of the banks are. Uh, preparing uh, themselves for, for the change, but it's a huge change, a technological change, fundamental change, a strategic change, and uh, uh, I think uh, then it's a question of uh, acceleration at the right moment. So, what is for sure, we should be ready and not be surprised, but then also ready to act quickly uh, because uh, there are a lot of uncertainties. Today, and regulatory ones are not of the least one, I would say. And then we have all the whole IT technological infrastructure of uh, banks that might be not so up to date to face uh, these new te technological uh, challenges. Flamin, you would like to comment? You've, you've been in a, in a bank as well, now you're on the other side as an entrepreneur. I've been in, uh, on the two sides uh, of the fence. You know, it's completely normal to see banks, you know, behave, uh, you know, in a very reasonable way. You know, you know, th their job is is to to manage risk and you know manage people's and you know clients' deposits and, and, and savings. That being said, you can really see, uh, you know, strong acceleration here happening in Switzerland. There was this big announcement from Bank from Togo last week, which shaked the market. Some players are getting very very nervous. And we know we cannot disclose that uh, you know other banks are, are, are you know have decided to enter that uh, that business. And once we have, I think what what can be also a very good effect, catalyst when we have once we have those exchanges or those regulated marketplaces, and you're going to see re reputable names issuing you know securities, whatever you name it, you're going to see you know even more, more you know more players there. So I agree with what uh, you said. Um, 2018, there has been some secret projects, you know, uh, you know, <coughs> happening. But uh, I can really see, you know, more and more uh, uh, banks getting uh, live with those types of uh, technology and even offering. And simply because today, frankly speaking, Switzerland is, is the best place to do these types of uh, activities. The regulator, and we mentioned it, is. There are obviously things to clarify, but the regulator is constructive. You have very good legal advisors. You have solid infrastructure provider, and uh, it just needs a bit of you know courage and, and leadership from some you know banking decision makers. And some have left, paved the way, and the others will follow. Like to just like to add something about the tsunami, because um, at the end of the day, the tsunami might also comes from the startups themselves, right? So not only from the banks. And the, the, the advantage that startups have is that they start from scratch. And in terms of cost, they are very good actually at managing very low cost of operations. They are very good at actually serving certain purpose for the customer. <coughs> and they go from a, a blank paper. Yeah. And I believe that the tsunami is really coming from the change of regulation. And if you look at it, um, we talk a lot about PSD2, but back uh, in 2008, we had PSD1. PSD1 was probably the enabler in, in the EU 
to have um, uh, the segregation of payment institution and uh, credit institution, right, banks. And now you have payment institutions, they are allowed to actually conduct part of the business of banks, which is payment, um, and all the ecosystem that goes with it. And of course now, um, we see with PSD2 that banks have to open up um, to fintechs so that they can actually um, use the client's data if the, if the clients want so um, and create a whole new ecosystem. And that I believe is where the tsunami might come from and banks have to adapt right now because simply they have new challenges coming. Today we see that it's only looking at specific use case of the bank, they don't do the whole thing yet, um, but it's building, it's building up. Do you think that the bank would change I mean, how much do they have to change in their business model to be able to be active in this field? Well, banks, they have this um, legacy um, uh, reputation, you know, mm -hmm. and we all trust our banks. Mm -hmm. And I, that is something more hard for people to trust a new player, um, even if they come with something that bears less risk in terms of how the balance sheet is exposed to risk. Um, but yeah, we'll see that people will be more and more educated about that, and at some point, We'll see a, a portion of people migrating from the traditional banking way to bank to uh, probably some newer ways. I was just going to say that um, the, the, the problem with any incumbent <coughs> institution that's trying to adapt to the digital world is, is one of um, that all of their, the, the entire business is structured around making money in the old paradigm, the industrial age, right? So in the case of banks, they're much focused on, on product lines, not, not people. Um, all the incentives are based on, on old revenue lines. So it's, it's really very difficult to make this change. It's, um, but those that do it will be way more successful because we're talking about businesses that have network effects that will be exponentially larger than, than the banks we've seen in the past. Um, but it does really require getting off the, the, you know, the, the not being addicted to some of the easy revenue that they had in the industrial age. And, re and really becoming much more central to their, to their customers' lives, helping them to make smarter financial uh, commercial decisions. But I think the, I, I, the only thing that will challenge is in, in the analogy of the tsunami, because I'm not sure banks do see this coming, right? I think it's much more like, um, the, the analogy we use is one of um, a, a boiling water, right? So if you, if you heat water from all sides, like, a, like in a microwave, um, you actually don't really see that the water is getting hot until it explodes. And I think that might be what we're seeing here, because as you said, you've got regulatory change, which is really significant. You've got technology change, which is really significant. You've got consumer behavior, which is changing quite quickly from entrance. And so I think it might be more analogous to talk of, you know, of, you know this boiling water uh, uh, scenario than, than just a tsunami that everybody sees and everybody's getting ready for. Um, but also, I think there are massive opportunities for those financial institutions that are moving ahead with new business models. But I'll be quiet on. Just, just add one thing. I think I, I, I agree with most of what you say, but I think adoption on the tsunami will also be driven by at least three additional moving parts and factors. One is interoperability, because it doesn't make sense if only one or a group of actors have their own private thing and another group as well. There will be a battle of sorts and someone will emerge unless they are interoperable. Second is scalability. It, it, it has been discussed ever, over and over again for blockchain, etc. Technology needs to be scalable. Today, we're talking about a fraction of a teeny, teeny fraction of assets. If you, we take the volumes that are being traded in ISDA swaps around the globe, if you want to put that on a single network that all those banks will operate, that's just huge in terms of volumes. But so the scalability is a factor. And final one is standardization. And, and that has multiple components. Today, banks do certain operations by you know Excel spreadsheets and taxes and coding and each one maintaining ledgers and doing it manually. But one of the reasons might be that, that they just didn't talk together to agree on a standard and they don't trust each other. So before they trust a single blockchain or distributed ledger technology, they would need to agree on a standard. And this standard will need to be compliant with all the regulatory reporting requirements in each and every jurisdiction of those banks. So I think the tsunami, yes, maybe, but it, the, 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 the sort of the distance to the tsunami is variable. Actually, there is one question which you already answered a, a little bit in, in, in your answer uh, from the audience. What are the concrete actions that a Swiss bank shall put in place to embrace blockchain technology? I don't know if you. 
from fiscal perspective, you want to answer that one? Well, um, I, will, I will come back to the tsunami uh, world to say that, so this is only my understanding of the, of the story. We are talking about a very, very deep change in the way uh, business is made for thousands of years. So what I'm saying is it's known forever, but it was a discovery for me when I discovered that two or three, some years ago. So every, every uh, business was made on uh, the need of a third party to trust, to get the trust and to, to, to operate a, a business. This trust now will be delegated to the full community. And this is a huge and deep, deep change. And it means that this is the reason why it will have impact at every stage of the business in the bank. Uh, we, can, we, have, uh, we, we have a lot of talks about regulation, we have also talked about KYC, uh, 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 save of cost, uh, new product for clients, new experience, more fast operation, and so on, so every stage. So the, the idea is that uh, it will depend on each bank to, to, to set some priority. There is not, not only one blockchain in the company, there is blockchain for KYC, <laughs> Production for new financial instruments, etc., uh, etc., et and uh, I, um, I would insist on the fact that uh, it's a it's a new technology. We know already some limitation of the technology. Blockchain to produce the trust need to be to ensure that nobody has more than fifty percent of the of computation power. For example, we know all that, and we, we have some experience with uh, Ethereum some weeks ago that it, it can lead some 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 very. Uh, so it means that it's it's new. Uh, it can be applied at all the stages of the of a, of a, of a bank. Uh, it will have impact for the bank itself, but for the clients also. It will not be the same impact. Reducing costs is good, but what would be how the, the cost uh, saving will be used for? Uh, we have to, uh, to to answer this question. And um, and still, for some of these very particular aspects of the blockchain, I was talking about uh, utility tokens. We still need some theoretical framework to be sure that we are all talking the same uh, subject and there is no abuse in this, uh, in this, uh, in this field also. So this is my, my feeling. Uh, we will have initiatives, but we can have initiatives in a very different uh, field. And so it will depend on each bank to decide in which field they want to, to start. Maybe one last comment on that theme, and then we can switch. I, I just like to, to demystify one thing, because many people um, think that it's super duper complicated, yes, the underlines are complicated, but today you have, you know, platform products that do everything a, a bank would expect, and you know that you know, you know cuts out the, the complexity. So, two things: one, from a technological perspective, if you want to integrate whatever, you know, gateway to a blockchain, it's easy. We've we've done it; it's easy, and you have other guys doing it. The second thing I would like to say: the most complicated thing is that people are uneducated. So what we do is, on our side, is, you know, we, we do trainings, we, you know, because, you know, in a nutshell, you need to understand a little bit, you know, the regulation, the implications of KYC, IML, the implications on how to, you know, to, to store those assets in order to be accounted off balance sheets, etc. So, and there's also a lot of, you know, um, uh, Really, the the, the, the the importance of education, of setting up new standards, is really critical. Once people understand the basics, they don't need to be experts. Frankly, the tech side is relatively quite easy, and it integrates with Temenos, Avaloc, Finstar, Finova, uh, you name whatever core banking system in a couple of days. So it's more a cultural change for you than a technology change? Like everything new, uh, there needs to be some cultural change because I've seen some of my ex fellow bankers, you know, some guys really seeing the tokenization potential, really, they, they really see it. And by the way, some say that quite cynically, right, the world, you know, is going to be even more capitalistic, right, because you're going to be able to tokenize even very small, you know, SMEs. And other guys see it, okay, blockchain equals Bitcoin equals scam equals ICO equals scam. So those guys, you know, I don't waste my time talking to those because, well, it's a, it, you know, it's it's a dogmatic view. Uh, it exists, but you have now people who really understood the potential. No, I just wanted to add a couple of things. Commenting on the question, what you need to start, 
Uh, and I think there are at least two very key elements. One is define what you want to do. Just it's not like oh we'll do blockchain. That doesn't mean anything. Just define the business model and start in small increments to get experience, etc. Second is either acquire the right resources internally or find the right partners. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. There are already things that are have been done, standardized, or you know are out there. So once you have your business model, just go find the right partners and then just start. <coughs> yeah, I just would like to add about standardization because I believe this is key. Um, CMTA is doing a marvelous job with that, um, really to try to push industry standards so that um, every participant could adopt them, right? And I believe this is the key element. And the first to start with is all about the compliance aspect because everything that you put on chain, as it was mentioned before in the presentation, has a counterparty, right? So you have cryptos, you have Bitcoin, etc. They do not have a counterparty, so they exist because they exist. But when you have tokens, you have an issuer and you have a lot of actors along the chain. And now you need to make sure that all those experts are respecting a certain framework uh, in terms of compliance. And this is, I think, the, the first brick that needs to be built and agreed upon among the participants. And today, I believe for the, 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 the only way to go forward in a proper way is to have several banks that sit together and that agrees on using this standard and implementing it <coughs> to use what is already implemented. Yeah, I mean, a lot of startups, including us, are working on that. On that. And I believe this is key now to start, spark out something, and then we can have usage. And then the complexity of using tokens, etc., will decrease over time. Uh, of course, uh, uh, at the origin, we were all printing emails back in the 90s. Uh, no one is doing it any <coughs> today. It will be the same. The, 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 the use of wallets, uh, uh, even the complexity of keys will disappear at some point because you will have custodians that will help you store the keys or you will have like a way to actually split the keys or have a multi-signature so that you're still in control but you give part of this control for backup to someone else, etc, uh, etc. Et so we'll see that disappearing as a, as a, as a barrier entry, uh, I'm pretty sure. But first is really to have people agreeing on the standard. A very concrete question for a little bit. <coughs> what about job creations in this process? Where do we, where do we stand in terms of jobs? What's going to happen? So, so again, I, I guess my, my job is to constantly take us up you know, to, uh, to the big picture. So I, I mean, I've, I've been working at Temenos, as you, as you said at the start, for um, 11 and a half years. And te what Temenos does is it, it, you know, it, it automates back office. So what, what, we, what we do, therefore, is we eliminate a lot of jobs in, in um, manual reconciliations, in, in, in IT, in, maintain, in maintenance, and back office functions. But I've not seen a bank that we've worked with that cut net headcount. I mean, people always get redeployed into, into different areas of the bank. And if we, if we take it up to a bigger level, you know, what happens with automation in general in our society? Will we see fewer and fewer jobs? I don't think so, because you know, um, for as long as there are massive problems that we haven't solved, there will be new jobs created. And I think it's probably quite a good thing that we move people out to really tedious back office jobs. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the jobs that people still do in banks. Um, and, 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 and have them perform uh, jobs that are much, much more important for society. I mean, climate change, for example, is a massive issue that we have not yet solved. So I just think for as long as there are huge issues with hunger, uh, climate change, etc., we will always find uh, places where people can do um, work and I think more value-added work. Do you agree, more or less? Um, well, my, this is my personal opinion. Um, there is too much um, extra money in the mm -hmm. banking system today that allows um, basically to have a lot of inefficiency. Um, I believe that this will shrink. Uh, the job market in terms of banks will shrink. Um, I believe that a lot of people will have to reinvent themselves and turn to some other sectors. Um, that's my personal belief. Uh, I mean, today you've seen so far up until now, the entry barrier was quite high. It's called the banking license. That means that all fintech startups that want to start and do some part of the banking business had to pass that. It's a very high uh, barrier entry. Now, because of change of regulation, we see that decreasing and we will see a lot of new actors coming and doing things in a way more efficient way. And efficiency will be the key because at the end, 
um, this, those savings will be passed back to back to the customer, and the customer will choose with his wallet. Let's, let's one. So I just want to make one follow-up follow -up point of this, which is this is absolutely true. There's way too much inefficiency in banking. Maybe banking is too big as a percentage of GDP <coughs> than it sh really should be. But there's one important point, which, which is if we drive down the costs of banking, we will open up banking to a much larger demographic. 40% of people today do not have any access to, 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 um, to banking whatsoever. Only a tiny fraction of people have access to capital markets. So I think, um, I think you know, while we bring down the cost of banking, we'll open up a bigger market. So I, I'm not necessarily sure that it's, you know, it's a, it's a positive sum game here, you know, I think overall. Maybe just a question about, um, you mentioned about the uh, regulatory barriers going down, but still, um, will that accelerate? Is still regulatory issues take time? They don't go that fast. Uh, you feel that, you know, we have still uh, some impediments ahead. How much would it take? To, to foster innovation? Looking at you. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, I cannot speak for the regulator or legislator. I mean, it takes the time it takes. I think in Switzerland, um, maybe you have a legislative system that is slower to get new laws in place, but at a certain level, regulation is sufficiently flexible to be adapted within the confines of the law. And Frankly, I think pushing specific targeted legislative measures for a specific sector because there is pressure to do so for some teeny bit of innovation is a wrong thing to do globally. You have to take the time to analyze the stresses and the risks for the rest of the system. And why would you give a preferential treatment to a teeny bit of innovation whereas the same innovation can be done differently maybe, maybe differently, maybe at a higher, slightly higher cost or, or otherwise within the the existing framework. But I think in Switzerland we're finding the right middle ground in terms of you know, promoting innovation and actually doing the right step, taking the right steps to improve regulation in favor of technology neutral and market neutral. <coughs> I just would like to add something here because Switzerland is a very specific country as well. Huh? I mean, if you look at it, we are as rounded with the EU. Um, where they did a very different move. Right? I mean, like back in 2008 with PSD1, that was already quite a bold move uh, to segregate the payment institution at the credit institution. Now with PSD2, banks have the obligation in the EU to share data with startups if the clients want so. And that is a big threat for, for the EU banks because now um, the risk is that they would become probably the authorized pipe, yeah? the, the one that can do um, that can hold the money and that can have access to the financial system. But then the front end, basically the, the customer facing, will probably uh, go towards more and more fintechs. Yeah? And that has no barrier entry because at the end of the day, they're not touching the regulated aspect. They're just using the data that is uh, at the bank. On, on, on the regulatory side, I'll be very short. There is room to do better. So I understand Fedor because the longer the process, the longer, uh, you know, more involved uh, lawyers are. But concretely speaking, there is way, uh, and I leave it uh, on my own, there is way to do better. Uh, you know, the mass in Singapore, FCA in the UK, smaller jurisdictions, Liechtenstein or Gibraltar, etc., they have service level, service level agreements. Concretely, it means. You deposit your file, if it's complete, we give you X weeks, X months to answer. It'd be great to have something like that in Switzerland. You mentioned about the client, but the client, you know, he can change, of course. But the question of trust is still central. One of the questions is governance, and that's one of the questions I, I got from the audience. Who is responsible in case of fraud or financial losses? What's going to happen? I think that's the question of trust. <coughs> Fedor? The real answer is it depends, but everybody expected that. Um, I think to, to, to add to the, the point, when you have multiple actors, small actors doing you know, client-facing things, and then you have some fraud and asset losses, the, you know, the, the, the one you will want to sue for liability will be the one having the most assets, so it will be the bank at the, at the end of the day in that scenario. Uh, not the startup that will just, you know, whatever something happens, it will collapse, and then will reinvent itself. But this is, it's, it's all a complex thing. I mean, you cannot look just uh, in isolation at the speed at which you can obtain a license. You have to look at the whole system uh, in, 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 in as a global thing. Uh, it doesn't help you if you can get the license quicker, but then you have X number of bankruptcy of financial institutions. 
doesn't help the stability of the system. Maybe a trade-off, of course, you can improve and the regulator can get add more resources and go quicker, uh, things can be more standardized, etc. But ultimately, it's the stability of the system as a whole that is at stake, and not just to you know, one actor that wants to get to the market quicker. Um, and also <coughs> here, there is one opportunity for startups, is to bring transparency. Um, I see a lot of people around me, and some of them are fed up with their banks. And especially because it's not transparent. Now, if you are leveraging the blockchain technology to also bring transparency in the way you conduct business, having your balance sheet, let, look at it for one second. If you tokenize the entire balance sheet of the bank, yeah, the liability side, all the clients deposit in fiat currency, and now the asset side, the loans, for example, to make it simple. Now you have your balance sheet that is readable in real time on the blockchain. And that brings also quite some um, um, trust in, in, in it, right? So people can actually, if a bank says, well, um, my uh, leverage ratio is this, well, you can, you can look and you can actually uh, uh, trust it because it's there, it's in real time. Yeah? I mean, today, most banks, the lowest granularity that they have on their balance sheet is daily. Yeah? And, and, and again, it's not published daily. That's very concrete, thank you. Yeah, my, my point, your, your example is great, but you know, I, I said it, I think, earlier, you know, uh, Building on what Fedor said, you know, you cannot use blockchain for everything. Uh, first of all, it needs to solve a problem better than the existing alternatives. So, if we find a way to tokenize a balance sheet very easily, yes, uh, today I don't see that, and we have other, you know, other types of use cases. But, um, but to me, you know, you were, people were talking about tsunami, etc. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm not, you know, blindfolded by the fact that we are operating in this space. And we are completely aware that in order to thrive, we need to be able to solve real problems better than existing alternatives. And today, there are some scalability issues, but in the same way, internet, you know, I remember in my teenage, you know, the internet with the modem 3.6, you know, today we have like 4G, 5G, it's gonna be solved. But the root cause, in the end, you need to be able to solve a problem. And I understand that there is a real case for financing SMEs, tokenizing, you know, real assets, but you will not be able to apply, in my op opinion, I might be wrong, blockchain everywhere. I have a concrete question. Why is it still complicated to open an account in Switzerland for blockchain entities which raised their money for an ICO? So I'm speaking for the banking sector, right? Thank you. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> no, it's in my opinion it's, it's because uh, well, as Vicky said it's new the, there are many uh, regulatory uncertainties and uh, uh, conducting an IPO has never been an easiest uh, the easiest thing to do so the process itself is complex is to, uh, uh, to leverage funds uh, and the barrier to entry the big advantage with ICO is, is is much lower, and this is the big advantage. Otherwise, the business as usual, you have to uh, <laughs> communicate on the ICO, you need a prospectus, you need experts, uh, and then <coughs> you, you need a bank account and to explain all this to the bank. <laughs> uh, uh, and I would, I would add that the, the big difference uh, between IPO and ICO is that IPO investors, when they, they, they buy shares, they buy with a bank account, so that the due diligence has already be, been performed. Whereas with ICO, you have no bank at all in the loop. So uh, when the ICO organizer is uh, opening an account with a bank, you have to do the whole due diligence job. And this is, this is the big difference uh, between the two. That's why it might be a bit a bit complex, but today you have the CMTA standards that hopefully help the market to understand. Well, maybe also as a question, is ICO on the decline and the STO on the rise? Um, well, we'll, we'll see both uh, cohabitate. I, I, don't, I don't think one will, uh, they are for different purpose, but just like to, the, the main issue that we saw also with ICOs and, and probably you saw it as well, is that most of the ICOs conducted in 2017 were done in 
kind of the wild wild west, right? So no KYC, no, no, no due diligence on the origin of the funds, no checks, nothing. And some of them were used as a way to actually launder their money. Yeah? And, and if you look at it, back in 2013, um, there were a big use case for Bitcoin, and it was called the darknet. Yeah, so now you've seen also a lot of criminals that at that time that are today millionaires, some of them even more than that. And they are looking for ways to recycle this money. ICOs is a good way. And, and of course that creates a big risk for banks to accept uh, uh, the, the Swiss franc coming from uh, the sale of cryptos. Yeah? And that of course creates what, what you presented before. You have to conduct the on-chain analysis to make sure that the money is actually coming from uh, uh, what is supposed to come from, that it has not been passed into mixers, into darknet, into whatever, etc. And that creates a very, uh, it's more, way more expensive to do this due diligence. <coughs> Sorry, just one, one uh, I would like to come back on the transparency uh, point that you uh, mentioned some, uh, some minutes ago. Uh, I was thinking that um, transparency, uh, of course, is, is, is good for, for the whole payer, of Sure. But you were talking about transparency at the real-time basis. And I'm not sure that these uh, uh, features or these possibilities without the correct educational level of all participants is a good point. Because uh, if at the real-time basis you see some fluctuation, you can override from that and you create instability. Uh, transparency is important, but I'm not sure that the real-time is important. You need sometimes to, to digest <coughs> the information that you get, especially if you are not educated enough to understand what's going on. And at the, at, the, at the end of the day, what is important is the stability of the system, that there is no fraud, no bankruptcy, and so on and so on. If you put things real time without uh, being sure that everybody is uh, able to understand the, the figures, you can face some instability, in, uh, you can put some stability in the system. So you, you have to be careful, and I come back to the uh, Damien point, education is a, is a key, key, key point also. One of the key points of the, the system. Well, you will see actors actually. You, you, so you would see different actors specializing. Some will target something very specific where it will be actually super appreciated and some others will actually run something in a different way because it has to be run in a different way. And every actor will actually basically go into uh, more specific use cases. We have a couple more minutes and I would like just to devote that uh, to the last theme is basically would you see Geneva and Switzerland as a hub for blockchain? I mean, we are in Geneva. Uh, now, banking and finance is a big topic here in this uh, in this city, and um, there was also a question linked to that. You know, why are Geneva-based banks so much behind those in Zurich in terms of working with innovative startups? But the question is broader than that. Is actually, you know, do we see Geneva, Switzerland as being a, a real hub in this? And I think that's uh, certainly of, of high interest for everybody in the room. Um, well, let's start first with Switzerland and then see Geneva. Frankly speaking, and we've read every single page of any report published by Federal Council, FINMA, it's a fact, and it's more of an, it can be seen also as an opinion. The Swiss regulator and the Swiss authorities are among the best educated in the world. They really know what they talk about. Um, um, so that, that, that's important because if you want to have, to create champions, or if you want to be leading in the industry, you know, which is regulated, you need to have the regulators ed educated and open. It, it is the case. Um, then, you know, the whole ecosystem, Patrick Odi was mentioning that in the morning, um, is there. You know, we, ha we are one of the biggest financial centers in the world, Geneva and Zurich together. We have very good value chain with legal advisors, fintechs, etc. The only missing point I see is really financing. Uh, we do not have, you know, uh, concretely, I give you a concrete example. We've been approached by tons of big VCs, Germans, Anglo-Saxons, French. You know, very little to no Swiss VC. Family offices, big families, yes, but really, growth capital is really what is missing today in order to to get the champions of tomorrow. And to continue on what you said, the um, the. The distinction between the French part and the German part of Switzerland uh, is clear. There is a rush to grow up on, actually. So in Geneva, we all know what's happening in Zurich and Zurich. Um, the opposite is not true. Um, 
But the reality is that there are a lot of things actually happening in Geneva. Uh, most of it is under the radar. Um, a lot of things have been moving. Banks are actually proactive today. Um, they want to work with fintechs because they see that fintechs are more agile. They can deliver things in a faster way. Um, and, and we'll see that today, Geneva has a, has a role to take, yeah? as a creating a new ecosystem um, from scratch on a good basis, um, where basically all the actors are in an ecosystem, right? Not fighting against each other, but actually uh, helping each other and growing together and having, as you said, creating a Swiss champion, creating a champion all together, all alone it's impossible. So it has to be web zero? <laughs> This is an outsider, um, although I've lived here for a long time. I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't draw the distinction between Geneva and Zurich um, necessarily. I think, um, as a country wide, I think I would agree that the regulator is very aggressive, and through the work we've been doing at CMT, I think um, the legal framework here can be applied in a very pragmatic way, which isn't necessarily the case in some other jurisdictions. And then the only other point I would make, I agree on the funding point. But I think that one of the other advantages, which which we maybe don't talk about enough, is that um, you know blockchain technologies are essentially software, right? And um, we don't need to leave fibers under the ocean to get this thing to scale. We just need great software engineers, and I think this country has some of the best software engineers in the world. And it won't take thousands. You know, it's not this is not a um, bell curve. You know, we just need really great software engineers working on this problem. So I think I think Switzerland stands a very very good chance of being a global leader. Just, just to, to add that, uh, yes, the fact that we add here near Geneva EPFL and near Zurich ETH is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for, for the place. As Lenin say, we already have uh, clients, a lot of clients, a lot of money is uh, managed here in Switzerland. Uh, we have uh, uh, experience also, the relationships is important to educate, to explain and to attract uh, clients and we have uh, uh, wonderful engineers as, as you said uh, I can I can tell I can uh, yes say that it's a, it's a really an opportunity for us to, to have uh, these two universities uh, around and, uh, uh, for sure Switzerland will will, uh, will stay uh, at, the, at the front of this uh, of this uh, GM space uh, for sure <coughs> maybe one last comment you know obviously I've always thought of you know Switzerland as a whole I don't segregate between one place versus the other. That being said, you have to recognize that um, the Zurich Zook place did quite a nice job in terms of marketing. So if uh, there is one thing we can do, and today there is real, real, real substance coming out of Geneva. I've never seen the CMTA standards being published before in the Crypto Valley, with all due respect, I love them, you know, we have clients there. So I think there we should communicate a bit more uh, the very fact that we had today the Geneva Forum Congress is a strong signal. So I think, and I hope we're at the beginning of, you know, also having you know two legs, one in the Zurich Zurich area and one in the Geneva in an international way. Maybe we should not mix up Zurich with Liechtenstein. I know it's quite clear. Yeah. One more question, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Two more minutes. Um, so I'm CEO of, uh, of a uh, blockchain startup, uh, Serial Air, and I can tell you, I think you are, you are too optimistic about uh, uh, Geneva chances or Swiss chances in general. Because number one, I can tell you, uh, as a support here, it's very difficult to, to get supported uh, by, by funds from, from the government. Uh, either Canton of Law or Canton de Genève, they say, ah, okay, 50k maybe, you know, uh, uh, for the for the for your uh, uh, facture, but uh, but it should you should be related to to academy here to UPFL or something, but we don't have time. Uh, we apply to them; they are busy right now. UPFL. So what we do? We hire Chinese developers who work for us. So three developers working full time for us cost us 5,000 francs per month. Okay. So in terms of you saying here that uh, uh, there are great developers, etc. in China, they are great. They are, I don't know, three, four times less expensive. And, uh, and yes, financing is, is a big issue. 
years. So I don't know, think about uh, Singapore, think about China, think about uh, Moscow, Russia. A lot of things happening there and uh, Geneva has a lot of competition. So there should be more support here, VCs, uh, state a a aids to, to startups. Otherwise, uh, you know, just wish we wish. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, yes, I agree with you, um, except that I don't think this is the role of the state or any canton or whoever to give you money. Uh, it should all come from private, from people that believe in what you do and they invest because they can stake into it. Uh, and that, indeed, as you said, it's missing here, right? So, I mean, I was in San Francisco and I was talking to a startup, there were two. Um, they were just having an idea, they wrote a paper and they got funding. This is something that will never ever happen in Geneva. We are a very conservative country, uh, especially here in Geneva. Um, that, that's not the way it works in Switzerland, and that of course is one of the drawbacks. There's plenty of money in Switzerland when you reach a certain size, when you, when you have proven that your business is working and that you want to scale to another level. That exists, but when you are a startup, that's true, there is no funding, except, as you said, if you're part of the EPFL ecosystem where uh, uh, you have something existing. If, if there's still time to add, I think on the funding point, the, I think the point we're all missing, which is which is that I think um, tokenization will really help, right? So I think I think funding, you know, we won't be talking about um, the difficulty of finding VC funding in a few years' time because I think the purpose of blockchain, or one of the many purposes of blockchain, will be to, to, to eliminate that problem in itself. And then just to address the point about scaling and you know hiring developers in China and so on. And Switzerland is never going to be a country where you build a really big organization just domestically. And I think that, that you, you know one of the things that this country does really well is that it brings together um, a very a very sophisticated pool of people who can create a company and get it to a certain size and who always scale. I think um, outside of Switzerland. Uh, so um, not to give Tamas a plug, but I mean Tamas is, is a Swiss headquartered company, and you know we have five thousand people, and you know only. 300 or so are here in Switzerland because it's just the nature of any company I think that scales, which is you know you have to find developers in a place where you can hire hundreds at a time. Right? So um, I, I take the point, um, but um, I, I don't think it's, you're ever going to get you know 100 or 200 thousand people come uh, uh, companies built here entirely. Thank you very much. I think we have to to close this session. Uh, I'm sorry because we had a lot of other questions which were asked or even giving you the floor Alex, like last time. And, um, but I think we need to go back to the plenary session. So I would like to thank all, you, all of you for attending this. And of course, all of our panel speakers for their thoughts, ideas, or suggestions. And uh, we'll probably be back in one year to see the progress which has been done for Swiss banks. Thank you.